on World News Tonight. Breaking ties. President Putin warns South Korea to not supply Ukraine with arms if the two nations are to continue bilateral relations. Virus winter. The United States prepares for a triple demic as the winter months set in. Rising interest. The European Central Bank raises interest rates with the aim of countering rising continental inflation levels. And it's a chocolate runway. French Olympians take to the fashion runway in dresses and clothes made of chocolate. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Now, President Vladimir Putin said that the world faced the most dangerous decade since World War II as Western elites scrambled to prevent the inevitable crumbling of the global dominance of the United States and its allies. Putin signaled that he had no regrets about what he calls a special operation and accused the West of inciting the war of playing dangerous, bloody and dirty game that was sowing chaos across the world. Sure. Russian President Vladimir Putin claims the West is seeking global domination. He made his comment in a long speech to a conference of international experts, politicians, diplomats and economists from 41 countries and outlined his vision of the world against the backdrop of the war in Ukraine. Now the historical period of undivided dominance of the West in world affairs is coming to an end. The unipolar world is becoming a thing of the past. We are at an historical turning point. Ahead, there is probably the most dangerous, unpredictable and at the same time important decade since the end of World War II. Putin accused the US and its allies of playing dirty. What we see now is the destruction of pan-European gas pipelines. This is absolutely horrendous. But nevertheless, we are witnessing these sad events. The power over the world is exactly what this so-called West has staked in their game. But this game is certainly dangerous, bloody and, I would say, dirty. In a tweet, the Ukrainian presidential adviser Mikhailo Podolyak describes Putin's speech as Freudian, saying Putin accuses others of wrongdoing, but that the Russian president was right about who started a wind will get a storm. In Washington, D.C., U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin called Russia an acute and pointed threat. However, he says the real threat is actually another country. At the same time, the NDS bluntly describes Russia as an acute threat. And we chose the word acute carefully. Unlike China, Russia can't systemically challenge the United States over the long term. Concerned about a possible escalation with Russia, he stated that the international community's response would be significant if Moscow launches a nuclear attack. Russian President Vladimir Putin has warned South Korea that any decision to provide weapon support to Ukraine will negatively impact bilateral relations with Moscow. So far, Seoul has only provided non-lethal supplies to Ukraine, with no indication that this stance is set to change. Russian President Vladimir Putin has reportedly warned South Korea that Seoul-Moscow ties will be destroyed if Korea provides weapon support to Ukraine. According to Russia's state-run news agency Sputnik, the remarks were made while Putin was addressing the Valdai Discussion Club, a gathering of Russia's specialists, on Thursday. The Russian leader also said that Seoul has decided to send weapons and munitions to Ukraine. So far, the Korean government has provided non-lethal military supplies to Ukraine, such as bulletproof helmets, blankets, as well as medical items. Seoul's defense ministry explained earlier there are, quote, limits with regard to offering lethal arms to Ukraine. It is not usual for the Russian leader to send a direct warning to South Korea, but it came as Putin criticized the U.S. for turning course in its denuclearization negotiations with North Korea by imposing sanctions against the regime when it seemed a deal could be struck. Also on Thursday, the Russian leader explained that the world faces the most dangerous decade since World War II. He warned that the world is facing a series of global conflicts, but a new world order is being formed right now. This new order, he said, needs to be reflected in the U.S. Security Council's composition. 
The United States has released its 2022 National Defense Strategy in light of North Korea's nuclear testing program. The documents include Washington's nuclear policies and posture amid growing threats around the world. With concerns over the possibility of North Korea going ahead with its seventh nuclear test, the United States released its latest National Defense Strategy report on Wednesday local time. Released by the Department of Defense, the report outlines the country's security priorities with the Nuclear Posture Review and the Missile Defense Review. The Nuclear Posture Review describes Washington's nuclear strategy, policy, posture and military capabilities with the goal of acting as a safe, secure and effective deterrent. The document sent a stern warning to Pyongyang. Though it didn't recognize the North as a rival on the same scale as China and Russia, the report evaluated the regime as a persistent, growing threat to the U.S. and the Indo-Pacific region with its expanding, diversifying and improving nuclear capabilities. It then warned that any nuclear attack by North Korea against the U.S., its allies and partners will result in the, quote, end of that regime. And to dampen the risk of a nuclear conflict, the report reaffirmed a cooperative approach such as building on already existing deterrence dialogues. The U.S. could periodically hold trilateral senior-level talks with South Korea, Japan, or a quadrilateral one with Australia added. In terms of Washington's policy toward the North, the U.S. is seemingly taking a carrot-and-stick approach. It will approach Pyongyang in a calibrated diplomatic way, but at the same time, will continue to press the regime to comply with United Nations Security Council resolutions and return to denuclearization talks. The UNSC resolutions ban North Korea from testing or launching ballistic missiles. The report also mentioned China and Russia as posing greater nuclear threats and, in response, will come up with tailored, country-specific approaches. For the first time in seven years, South Korea is taking part in Japan's fleet review scheduled for early next month. However, some criticize the move as the flag used by the Japanese Navy is seen by many Koreans as highly offensive as it resembles the flag of the Japanese Empire, which was in control of the Koreas in 1930s. South Korea has decided to send a 10,000-ton logistics support ship called Soyang to take part in Japan's fleet review, coming up on November 6th. The country's defense ministry made the announcement Thursday and said the decision was made based on the fact that the country's navy has participated in the event twice before and considering the security situation on the Korean Peninsula following a recent series of provocations from North Korea. This is the first time since 2015 that South Korea is taking part in the event and officials say it took time for them to decide whether to do so this year because the flag or ensign used by Japan's navy is almost identical to the flag of the former Japanese Imperial Army. It features the rising sun emblem, viewed by many South Koreans as a symbol of the Japanese colonial rule. The country made the decision at the last minute, months after the Japanese government invited South Korea to the event in January. In 2018, Japan decided not to take part in South Korea's fleet review as it rejected Seoul's request of not using the red and white flag on its warships. Following the review, the South Korean ship will be joining a multinational search and rescue exercise through November 7th. Also, the South Korean Navy's top officer, Admiral Lee jong ho will take part in the Western Pacific Naval Symposium, along with top naval officers from around 30 different countries. This year's International Fleet Review, hosted by Japan, will mark the 70th anniversary of the founding of Japan's Maritime Self-Defense Force. Israel and Lebanon separately signed a U.S. brokered maritime border deal which paves the way for lucrative of offshore gas extraction by the neighbors that remain technically at war. The agreement is set to go on into effect after two exchanges of letters, one between Lebanon and the United States, the other between Israel and the United States. Israeli and Lebanese leaders signed a landmark U.S. brokered agreement on their maritime boundary on Thursday. The historic two-sided effort marks a diplomatic departure from decades of hostility and paves the way for offshore energy exploration. <laughs> Lebanese President Michel On signed a letter approving the deal in Babda, followed by Prime Minister Yair Lapid's signature in Jerusalem. At the start of a cabinet meeting, Lapid hailed the move. This is a diplomatic achievement. It's not every day that an enemy country recognizes the state of Israel in a written agreement in view of the international community. It's not every day the United States and France stand behind us and provide security and economic guarantees for an agreement. This is an economic achievement. 
Lebanese negotiator Elias Boussab said it marked the beginning of a new era between the two sides, which technically remain at war. The accord removes one source of potential conflict between Israel and Iranian-backed Lebanese group Hezbollah and could alleviate Lebanon's economic crisis. Amos Hochstein, the US envoy who mediated the negotiation, told reporters he expects the agreement to hold regardless of changes in leadership in both countries. I truly believe and hope that this can be an economic turning point in Lebanon for a new era of investment and uh, continued support to lift up the economy and make sure that whatever arrangements happen, they're done openly, transparently, and making sure that the benefits are felt directly by all the Lebanese people. On Wednesday, U.S. President Joe Biden branded the accord a historic breakthrough. And I compliment you and I compliment the government. An offshore energy discovery, while not enough on its own to resolve Lebanon's deep economic problems, would be a major win. It would provide much-needed hard currency and could ease crippling blackouts one day. While Lebanon and Israel have both voiced satisfaction with having settled a dispute peacefully, prospects for a wider diplomatic breakthrough appear remote. With On saying in a statement that the deal has no political dimensions or impacts that contradict Lebanon's foreign policy. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, worried that the rapid price growth is becoming entrenched, the European Central Bank is raising borrowing costs at the fastest pace on record, with further hikes almost certain as unwinding a decade's worth of stimulus will take, will take it well into next year and beyond. The European Central Bank raised interest rates again on Thursday, hiking its deposit rate by a further 75 basis points to 1.5%. That's the highest rate in more than a decade. And ECB President Christine Lagarde warned the end is not in sight just yet. Have we finished the normalization of our monetary policy as we have called it? No. There is still ground to cover. The ECB also signaled it was keen to shrink its bloated 8.8 .8 trillion euro balance sheet, adding that substantial progress had been made in fighting off a historic surge in inflation. The central bank for the 19 countries that use the euro is worried that rapid price growth is becoming entrenched. It's been raising borrowing costs at the fastest pace on record. Investors now see rates peaking at around 2.6% next year, below previous expectations for close to 3%. The euro and bond yields dropped on the news while bank shares rose. In Berlin, the German finance minister applauded the move. I welcome the fact that the ECB is fighting inflation very resolutely, Christian Lindner said. The ECB also curbed a key subsidy it provides to commercial banks through trillions of euros worth of ultra-cheap three-year loans called targeted longer-term refinancing operations. The move will boost borrowing costs over the remaining lifetime of the facility, providing lenders an incentive to repay them early. As for the criticism that the hikes would send the eurozone into recession, Lagarde pushed back. Eurozone inflation is currently just under 10 percent, and Lagarde says it's her job to get that under control. U.S. doctors are warning that a surge in cases of respiratory syncytial virus is con coinciding with an increase in COVID transmission and an earlier than normal flu season, raising the specter of triple-demic of respiratory illness in the winter. Health officials are growing worried about a so-called triple-demic, an onslaught of respiratory illnesses that has many medical experts concerned for the upcoming winter season. The culprits? A surge in cases of respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV, combined with an increase in COVID in an earlier-than-normal flu season. Those mostly impacted by RSV are infants under the age of 5 and adults over the age of 65 and emergency rooms are already feeling the impact of an earlier-than-normal surge, according to Dr. Peter Hotez. Um, pediatric emergency rooms are getting flooded with, with patients, kids with RSV. You usually don't see it in the fall, it usually as we get closer to the winter, but it's happening earlier this year, possibly because kids have not been in contact with one another for a couple of years because of social distancing or masks. And again, among older individuals, 
um, it can cause uh, pneumonia, and it's very hard to distinguish that from influenza or, or COVID-19. Meanwhile, data from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention shows that the coronavirus is still spreading and claiming lives, with the United States reporting 260,000 new cases a week and over 2,500 deaths, which is why U.S. President Joe Biden on Tuesday urged more Americans to get the booster before the upcoming holiday season. We still have hundreds of people dying each day from COVID in this country, hundreds. That number is likely to rise this winter. But this year is different from the past. This year, nearly every death is preventable. Let me say it again. Nearly every death is preventable. Only 20 million people in the United States have received an updated COVID booster. And just one in five seniors, the White House said last week. Another looming threat is the flu. The CDC said earlier this month that there are early increases in seasonal flu activity reported in most of the United States. And Dr. Hotez warns patients can get more than one infection at once. With three different viruses circulating, one of the reasons why you might be seeing more hospitalizations is kids or adults are getting co-infections. Some combination of RSV with COVID, with influenza, and by the way, other respiratory viruses. So if you can take one or two of them off the table by getting vaccinated, that's a big help. The U.S. economy has posted positive growth for the first time this year, with third quarter figures temporarily easing fears about a recession. However, the S&P 500 and Nasdaq were slammed as investors dumped blue chip tech stocks like Amazon and Meta, which have posted disappointing earnings over the past couple of days. Going against previous expectations of slower economic growth in the United States, the country's GDP accelerated 2.6 percent in the third quarter, posting positive growth for the first time this year. According to the Bureau of Economic Analysis released Thursday, GDP increased at a 2.6% annualized rate for the period, above the Dow Jones forecast of 2.3%. The latest figure shows consecutive negative quarters to start the year, putting the U.S. in a position that lined up with the commonly accepted definition of a recession. The report notes that the growth was largely due to a narrowing trade deficit, it also noted that gains came from increases in consumer spending, non-residential fixed investments, and government spending. However, declines in residential fixed investments and private inventories offset the gains. With the report of a better-than-expected growth rate, the U.S. stock market saw a mixed day of trading on Thursday. The Dow Jones Industrial Average gained more than 300 points in early trading, but the S&P 500 and the tech-heavy Nasdaq posted losses as investors contended with solid economic data and a mixed bag of corporate earnings. Despite Thursday's positive GDP growth report, analysts say inflation-weary consumers and businesses will have less money to spend over the upcoming holiday season, leading to a massive sell-off in major tech stocks. Welcome back to World News Tonight, and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Elon Musk completed his $44 billion acquisition of Twitter, Inc. Musk, in his first move, terminated Twitter chief executive, chief financial officer, and the legal affairs and policy chief, who were escorted out. Production of the first circulating British coins featuring an image of King Charles III began at a Royal Mint facilities in Wales. The first coin bearing a portrait of King Charles is a memorial 50 pence honoring Queen Elizabeth II, which will go into public circulation in December. Red Bull Racing called a news conference at the Mexican Grand Prix amid media reports that the team had agreed a settlement with the governing FIA on spending more than allowed last season. Apple reported revenue and profit that topped Wall Street targets, although iPhone sales were not as strong as some analysts had targeted. Apple's saving grace were max sales of $11.5 billion far ahead of analyst estimates of $9.36 billion. Monza soccer player Pablo Marie has been stabbed along with at least four other people in a shopping mall in town of Asago outside Milan. A 46-year-old suspect has been detained and the motive for the attack in a supermarket was not clear.
And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again on Monday for more news around the globe. In case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we leave you tonight with visuals of Paris Fashion Fair. Human-sized shells and dresses made out of chocolate were strutted out on a runway show by models, including Olympic athletes. Stay safe and have a great weekend.